is somewhat somewhat falls in the lap too i think though of the attorney it because does. the attorney can't just go in and say well this is going to be a slam dunk because well things can happen who knows exactly i've never told the client you're going to win this case you never know i don't no. care how good your yeah. facts are facts are facts the way they're presented mm -hmm. who your particular jurors are that mm -hmm. that week right uh, you know it, it's there is never a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Are wrong decisions made sometimes? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, the law is a, a mm -hmm. human-driven uh, human machine. Mm -hmm. um, there is error yeah. uh, because we are humans. I think if a judge pays attention, listens carefully, and if it's a judge making the decision, let's say it's a, a court right. trial, mm -hmm. um, and if it's a judge making the decision, you have to rely upon what the lawyers present as facts. Right. Judge can't make their own investigation. You have to rely upon what is presented by the parties, and that's what you're limited to. And then you look at the law, you apply the law to those facts, and then you have to make a decision. Um, and, and, it, and I think that sometimes, you know, um, I do know that many times clients will, you know, certainly accept a decision if they feel that the judge did indeed do the things that you mentioned, mm -hmm. that they listened that they were thoughtful, that they had a good uh, courtroom presence, and that they, mm -hmm. you know, that they had a good temperament to them. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I think people can accept a decision that may not necessarily be in their favor if they feel that they were listened to and they were well considered. And I think that kind of goes then to other things beyond just the making of the decision, mm -hmm. it's actually how do you run your courtroom? Exactly. Yes. Do you give the parties the full extent of the time mm -hmm. that they need? Mm -hmm. Are you allowing them the opportunity to fully present their side and to make their arguments um, rather than just trying to move it along, move it along, move it along? Everybody's under time pressure because, like I said, there's way more cases than there are, yeah. are, are judges. There are way more cases than there are public defenders and prosecutors. We're all, we, we're never at a loss, mm -hmm. <laughs> a mm -hmm. loss for things to do. There's a, a big backlog of cases. And when that happens, you still have to remember that every case is an important case. Right. Every case is important. Everybody deserves their day in court. Some cases take a little longer than others. But I agree with you. If a litigant feels like the judge listened to them, that they were able to say everything that they wanted to say, and if the judge explains their decision, mm -hmm. I'm ruling this way because I felt this person was credible and this person wasn't mm -hmm. because of you know these reasons just simply making a decision without an explanation is probably pretty frustrating for the average right. litigant because you don't know where you went wrong right you don't know why the decision was made so i think taking that time to not only make the decision but to explain the decision mm -hmm. i think and if a judge does that and treats people with enough respect to do that um, I think people, like you said, even though they might not be successful, they might not have gotten the outcome that they wanted, I think in the long run they'll be happier with their court mm -hmm. system. Well, and then they understand why it came out the way it did. Mm -hmm. and, um, and unfortunately, with our litigation system the way we have it, mm -hmm. uh, you typically do have a winner and a loser. I mean, exactly. it, you know, I mean, and there's various degrees of all of that, of course, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, part uh, of the case is won by the one party and part of the case is won by the other party. Mm -hmm. And everybody goes home feeling like they were really ripped off. <laughs> well, exactly. We find you liable, <laughs> but there were no damages. Yes. You know? Oh, you know, that was probably the hardest lesson I ever learned as a new attorney is that I had this big arbitration case and you know what we proved that there was liability it was i'm like wow this is great but unfortunately my my client didn't have too much in the way of being able to really demonstrate the damages mm -hmm. so our damages were really actually minuscule compared to what they could have been if my client would have been a better bookkeeper but you mm -hmm. see it's one of those things you have to learn is that you could have a great case and you could prove all the liability in the world, but if you don't have damages, it doesn't mean much. It's nothing. It's the empty, <laughs> empty victory. That, that's right, exactly. You know, and so that's, 
you know, but but there again, that that kind of goes back to that perspective of in from where you're coming from is that you've had a lot of this type of experience and where you've been in criminal trials, civil trials, management, and you can bring all those things to the table mm -hmm. uh, when you're elected judge. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's that says a lot. Thank Just you. right there. Great. So I, I think another ahead. thing I'd like to add yes. too is, you know, we live in a very diverse community. Mm -hmm. It gets more diverse every day. We have um, we have you know a huge Hmong population in St. Paul. We have a very large Latino population. We are getting an increasingly large number of um, African immigrants, mm -hmm. Somalian, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia. With that becomes a whole bag of issues that you know are aren't present in other cases. You have the language barriers. Mm -hmm. You need interpreters. The difficulty of actually communicating with your client. I can't call up my client on the phone because I don't speak the same language. That's right. That uh, creates you know a whole host of problems right there. Cultural differences. We brought this up uh, the other night at a forum. <clears throat> Somebody asked what experience I had with diversity, and I said you need to understand the cultural norms of these people. <clears throat> Excuse me. For instance, in the Hmong culture, it's considered disrespectful to look someone in the eye. In our culture, it's considered a sign of respect. And if you don't look someone in the eye, you are looking evasive. You're trying to hide something. So if you don't understand those different customs and those different mannerisms, you can jump to the wrong conclusion pretty right. quickly. Right, because certainly if you were the judge and you mm -hmm. were expecting that the defendant is supposed to be looking at you, the judge, and being respectful that way, but they're not. They're not. Because and you might think, oh my God, they're really guilty. Exactly. <laughs> and it isn't that at all. Right. Why aren't they looking me in the eye? It's yeah. like, well, that would be considered disrespectful mm -hmm. in their culture. So I think that's also important. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of touches on, I think, what the caller was saying, you know, the top echelon. You know, who are these people that are making decisions about other people in the community? I think you need to have a full understanding, <coughs> excuse me, of those people who live in that community. Mm -hmm. You need to understand the different pressures put on them by their cultural differences. You need to understand their fi family dynamics. Mm -hmm. You need to understand kind of how they make decisions and why these people might make decisions that you think might be very different than a decision you would make given their circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I have that experience. We have a very diverse population at, in, as far as our clientele goes. You know, we meet with their family members. You know, we know kind of what goes on in their family lives and kind of how they look at things and how they view the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying just because you come from another culture, you don't have to follow our laws. But I think you need to understand some of the, the dynamics that mm -hmm. go behind people right. and why they do the things they do. Right. Whether exactly. or not they're going to be able to succeed on probation. What's important to them? Well, you know, and I think you bring up a really good point because, you know, the judge does have a certain amount of discretion, especially when it comes to talking about probation and what kind of parameters are supposed to be included within that probation. And if you aren't aware of what some of those... Uh, you know, diversity issues are, mm -hmm. then you might be setting up the defendant uh, for failure by per saying, well, they got to do this or that or the other thing, mm -hmm. and maybe that isn't the most effective thing. Maybe it actually would have been something else, exactly. which, you know, it, ultimately we want people to be successful in completing their probation, and uh, that way then they can be productive members of society. I mean, that's the whole point in many regards, you know, and say, well, you know, you did something bad, mm -hmm. you learn from it, you don't do it again, and, you know, exactly. move that's, on with the rest of your life in a good spirit, you know? That's the purpose of probation. Yeah. So the person doesn't reoffend. Yeah. And to protect public safety, monitor them until they can prove that they've changed their ways and that they can return to society and, you know, and be a productive uh, citizen. So probation is meant to help not only the person, but it's meant to help protect public safety. And I think a lot of people think, oh, you just gave them probation. I'm like, probation serves a purpose for the community. It protects the community. Right, right. You can't just lock everybody up and throw away the key. No. Uh, we just can't do that. No, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> now, I understand we might have another caller on the line. Uh, caller, are you there? Questions or comments for us? Yes, I am here. 
Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Diana and Ms. Uh, Averson. Oh. Uh, my question is probably going to be kind of different for you. Uh, most of our uh, judges that are on the bench right now seem like they have forgotten about constitutional law and are mainly uh, working off from uh, case laws or, in fact, making laws from the bench uh, at the time they're there. And these are uh, not uh, um, part of the legislative process. I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Iverson how she would rule from the bench and if she would be a uh, proponent of the uh, constitutional law, and I, I would like to sit and listen to this. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, uh, that question. I'll, I'll lob that back over to you. Okay. Well, the Constitution is the bedrock of our legal foundation. Without the Constitution, our society and our uh, court system would be very different. Mm -hmm. We're lucky that the Founding Fathers wrote such a great Constitution that it, we could still use it today. I mean, it's something that can adapt to the times. Now, some people, you know, bring up the phrase strict constructionist. Are you a strict constructionist? I think that the Constitution is something that is adaptable to changes in society. You know, back when, let's talk about just some, a simple part of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, uh, the search and seizure law, Fourth Amendment. You have a right to be free from search and seizure. Well, back when that was written, we're talking about, you can't come into my house without a warrant. Mm -hmm. I have a right to privacy in my house. Well, that has extended and expanded, and we can still use the right to privacy to protect other areas. As our society grows, as technology changes, we drive around in automobiles now. Does the search and seizure amendment, does that apply to automobiles? Does it apply to com computer data? Does it apply to your briefcase? Does it apply to your hotel room if you stay somewhere else? Or, or to satellites beaming down and looking into your backyard. Exactly. Your cell phone, things that you use on yes. a day-to-day -day basis. I think we are lucky that our founding fathers did such a great job with the Constitution that we can apply those core principles of freedoms, right to privacy, and those types of freedoms that, to changing technology. So yes, I think the Constitution is the bedrock of our law. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the legislature also passes laws, you know, in addition to the Constitution. Sometimes a judge might not like the law, but that's not the judge's decision to disregard the law mm -hmm. because it goes against maybe some of their personal principles or, some, you know, they think the law should be something else. A judge takes an oath to uphold the law, whether they like it or not. A judge can't ignore the law that's passed by the legislature. You know, we have a three-branch system of government. Mm -hmm. Each branch has its own function. If the legislature passes a law, the judge is bound to uphold that law and make sure that it's followed. So in that regard, a judge's hands are somewhat tied. I get questions all the time. Um, I had one just a couple of days ago. A gentleman had called me. I had left a... Uh, a brochure at his door and he called and he had a couple of questions and he was concerned that uh, people who commit criminal vehicular homicide, people who dr drink and drive and kill someone, mm -hmm. he doesn't think those sentences are harsh enough. And he said, I read about him in the paper all the day and he goes, they just seem way too light. And he goes, why do judges do that? And I basically said, well, you have to start with your legislature. Right, because they're they, the ones that enacted that. They determine yes. what the penalty is. Mm -hmm. They pass the guidelines. They tell you how to rank that crime and how big of a sentence you should give to someone based on their criminal history. A judge is pretty much bound to follow that because the legislature passes the law. The judge has to uphold the law and make sure that it's being followed. So in that regard, I understand the... Uh, sometimes a kind of frustration that people think the Constitution isn't being followed. And I've heard, um, you know, people say, well, it's only case law. Well, case law basically interprets different laws, whether they're passed by the legislature. If they're important search and seizure issues, they do uh, s somewhat have to interpret the Constitution. You know, uh, for instance, this is case law. It's not in the Constitution. But if a police dog comes up and sniffs your car, is that a violation of your right to privacy? Well, there's nothing in the Constitution about dog sniffs of automobiles, obviously. No. Because they didn't have automobiles back then. Right. But it's up to the court system to determine whether or not there is a right to privacy and whether or not that 
Uh, dog sniff is an invasion of that right to privacy. So case law does play an important part.